uh, Dr. Liang Li from uh, Peking University. Um, his, uh, the title of his talk is Informational Masking of Speech in People with uh, Schizophrenia. Thank you for the chair. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks so many people for inviting me in and uh, make this symposium possible. Okay, let's start uh, uh, to mention some uh, Chinese archaic characters. So we know the earliest Chinese character occurred over 3,000 years ago in Tang, in Shang dynasties. So people just uh, inquired some character in animal bones and, tur and the turtle shells. Here, I just want, want <coughs> okay, over 2,000 characters have been recognized. So here, I just want, want to mention one character, meaning hearing. So in ancient time, the people in, in Shang Dynasty used one ear on the left side instead of the two, instead of one, they present the two mouses on the right side, one at the superior position and one at the inferior position meaning hearing mainly deal with multiple voice situation. Indeed, over the long history for human beings, there are many situations for handling multiple voice situation. Sometimes the situation was so serious, so fatal, or even more serious in the modern time. So if we want to recognize one person's voice, this person's voice is masked by the surrounding sounds. So generally, there are two types of maskings. One we call the energetic masking. Energetic masking occurred when peripheral neural activity elicited by the signal is overhead by that of the masker, leading to degraded neural representation of the signal and the audibility of the signal. In the laboratory, we used a steady state speech spect spectrum noise as the masking stimulus uh, to generate uh, energetic masking. So for example, if we make a recording from a single auditory neuron and increase sound gradually, you can see the fine rate increase and gradually reach the uh, flat phase. So if we provide the master background making this neuron fine, so the dynamic range of this neuron will be narrowed, <coughs> causing an ejection masking. Now, here I just want to mention the second type of masking, even more important, we call information masking. So information masking occurs when both the signal and the masker are similar in certain types of the spectral temporal patterns, confused with one another particularly when both signal source and masking source are speech. Due to the confusability of the target and masking speech and all the requirement of the central resource that are, that are devoted to the processing of the masking speech. Masking speech may interfere with the processes of target speech and the different levels perceptual level or cognitive level. Now, we want to build a link between information masking and the schizophrenia. Okay, here's my title. Uh, we know schizophrenia uh, exhibit impairment on a wide assortment of neuropsychological tasks. Recently, we just found in from people with a schizophrenia are more vulnerable to masking, especially informational masking, compared their demographic controls. For example, we ask a participant to recognize speech in a background of either noise or speech, and gradually increase the signal to noise ratio. You can see 
for the first episode of patients, they have a good ear, okay, normal hearing, and they have a, a small difference in, in the threshold compared to their controls. But when the mask switch from energetic to informational, you can see bigger difference between patients and controls in either first episode of patient and the chronic patients. Okay. 60 years ago, a professor named Colin Cherry from MIT okay, proposed a very famous problem. It's called the cocktail party problem. How do we recognize what one person is seeing while others are speaking at the same time? Okay, let me just get, give a quick explanation of this problem. Okay, in a cocktail party, several people are talking at, at the same time, and the one listener wants to know what's going on the other side, the corner of the room. Okay, this speaker may see something important for him, even though the voice is weak, and uh, the signal of this speaker combined in the ear canal into a compound. This listener can also extract signal from the target talker. So this is why, why it happened. This is a cocktail party problem. The beauty of this paper is not only the proposal of a very famous problem in science, also suggest some factors that may give mental facilities to listeners. These factor into some uh, acoustic of, uh, cues, some visual cues and the spatial cues. So here I just want to mention the effect of the spatial separation. Two sounds, left side and the right side and the right side. The left side is defined as a signal Due to the head shadowing effect, the sound from the right side reaches the left ear, and the energy becomes lower, causing an increase in signal to noise ratio on the left ear. So that is the head shadowing effect. So provide a better ear to the listener. Also, the sound from, from the left speaker to the left ear comes to the ear early than the right ear. So there is an inter-oral time difference. So there is a disparity between the two sound sources in inter-oral time difference. So these binaural cues can be used by the audio system. It's pretty automatic. So this effect can occur in anesthetic rights. Now, if the cognitive party is held in a reverberant environment, each of these sound cells produce numerous reflections. Under such an environment, some people already provide solid evidence to show that a highly reverberant environment significantly reduces the height shadow advantage and obscures internal time defense, okay, thereby significantly reducing the spatial separation effect. However, when the masker is a speech, Spatial separation still has some unmasking effect. So Dr. Kidd suggests factors other than head shadowing and the binaural processing may be considered. Okay, now spatial separation can provide several level cues, acoustic level, neurobiology level, and perhaps psychological level. So if we can find some method to remove the first two levels so we can isolate the third one. So how people to handle the reflections in a reverberant environment? Okay, let me take a test. We build a wall on the right side, okay, to produce the reflections. Actually, we do not build a wall. We use a loudspeaker to simulate the reflections. So we present the direct sound and the reflection sound and change the time interval between these two sources. So when the interval is small enough, 
listener just receive a single sound image as coming from the left side. So this phenomenon is called the precedence effect. Even though the sound level are, are the same on both sides, so a listener cannot recognize a distinct sound image as coming from the right side. So our theoretical explanation of the precedence effect is based on the attribute of capture. The idea is, in a reverberant environment, there are many sound sources. So each sound source produces many, many reflections. But the auditory system has such ability to calculate the similarity, correlation between sources. Because the reflections have a high correlation with its direct sound waves. So they have a high correlation. And the attribute of the lagging sound are captured by the leading sound perceptually. OK, just make some uh, perceptual, perceptual field sound images. OK, for example, you have a left loudspeaker and a right loudspeaker and present the same sound simultaneously. So when the sound, when the sound interval is high, we receive the two distinct sound images. So with the reduction of the sound interval, the image become fused, OK? And gradually, the impact is of the sound image is reduced. Eventually, when the sound interval becomes zero, we just receive a single impact sound image as come from the frontal area. So this is a perceptual integration. Now the question is, is the perceptual integration of speech sound useful in a reverberant environment? We conduct this study. Two loudspeakers present the targeted speech, and the right loudspeaker is the leading one. So sound image is perceived as coming from the right side because of the precedence effect. OK, the same loudspeaker are used to present the masking speech. OK, when the, left, when the right loudspeaker is the leading speaker for the mask speech. The masking sound image is as coming from the right side. Okay, so when the in under this situation, when we focus on the target, we have to pay attention to the masker because they come from the same spatial location. Okay, when the left loudspeaker is the leading speaker for the masker. The mask image is perceived as coming from the left side. So there is a perceived spatial, spatial, spatial separation between the masker and the target. OK, it's uh, easy to understand. So such a perceived spatial separation play a critical role to improve uh, speech recognition and the masking, especially under speech masking. Now, the uh, perceptual integration between leading sound and the lagging sound uh, needs another auditory function we call the primary auditory, uh, primary auditory memory, which is the starting point when people recognize speech in a reverberant environment. So memory to keep fine structure signal of the leading sound for a shorter period of time, allowing the neural computation of the correlation between leading sound and the lagging sound. So when the simi similarity is high enough, the attribute of the lagging sound is captured, making the precedence effect. So making the perceptual segregation, when there is a special uh, perceptual segregation between masker and the target, the listener can pay attention to the target and ignore the masker. So just improve the recognition of a target. So how about the schizophrenia? OK. Um, there's no anechoic chamber in psychiatric hospital. So we need to bring the sound to the hospital. We, make, we use a dummy head to make a recording of the sound used in, in the experiment because when the sound is recorded by the dummy head and play back to the listener. Listener can have such a feeling the sound comes from speech. It's called uh, externalized. Okay. 
So we bring the sound to psychiatric hospital, ending hospital. We got the data there. Okay, for the controls, you can see there's an effect of the spatial separation, the circle. Yeah, surprisingly, even people with chronic schizophrenia, they have a low score compared to the controls. They still can use the perceived spatial separation to improve their recognition of speech. Okay, we go to the neural basis. Okay, conduct FMR experiment. Okay, for the controls, perceived spatial separation can increase neural activity in several brain regions outside the auditory system. It's a surprise. Okay, these brain regions can be divided into two categories. One deal with speech production. The others deal with error-related response inhibition and uh, focus on particular sound sources in a cluster auditory environment and dealing with audi auditory, auditory attention to speech and the high processing load. This is the result from normal people. But for the patients, they provide a totally different patterns. Okay, these active structures, according to the literature, shows reduction in gray matter volume, suggests decline of functions of these structures. For example, the left superfrontal cortex so according to the study by Kirschers and a colleague, the number of complex sentences in the syntax production is correlated with the activity of the left suprafrontal cortex in control group, not, not in the patient group. Okay. Also, according to study by Koffers and a colleague, in patients with schizophrenia, reduce the function recruitment in the left superfrontal cortex occurs during listening to a story with a social, social interactions between characters. Okay. Now, we come back to the famous paper, Cherry's paper. Several other perceptual cues can be used, okay, in addition to spatial cues. In my lab, my students also found, indeed, there are several cues which is helpful, including the contact cues and the vocal cues. So in a cocktail party, there are many perceptual cognitive cues available for listeners for segregating target stream from masking stream. So listeners just use these cues dynamically. Okay, also, there's a link between cocktail party problem and the binding problem. I think you agree with us. There are two famous problems in psychology and the neuroscience. According to my understanding, they share the same principles. Now, we know that schizophrenia people available okay, can use the spatial cues. How about the other cues people with schizophrenia cannot use? Okay, recently my postdoc, Chao Wu, just found an interesting uh, phenomenon. The temporary pre presented lip reading cues can be used by normal hearing listeners for unmasking speech. The idea is lip reading, you know, contains. Uh, rich information about the speech content. So if we present liberating in quiet, sometime later we present the targeted speech masked by, uh, sorry, present the targeted speech masked by uh, irrelevant speech. So there is a time delay. If the liberating match the target, there's an improvement of the performance. If they are not matched, so the performance is low. That means the listener can use both their working memory abilities 
and uh, audio vision integration abilities to finish this task. How about the schizophrenia people? <laughs> Indeed, schizophrenia, schizo schizophrenics totally cannot use such kind of cues. Okay, we got one. And uh, we measured uh, both contract. We see for the uh, normal people, some brain activities, that's pretty make sense. These brains include those dealing with biological motion, face, visual integration, and some brain structure dealing with attention, others dealing with uh, face working memory because there is a time delay. Also some people dealing with motion planning, water re uh, error response inhibition. But for the people with chronic schizophrenia, once again, they provide a different pattern of the neural activity. The same, some of the structures also uh, exhibit reduction in green matter volume. Okay, now our question is, why some dysfunctional brain regions in schizophrenia become hyper when perceptual cognitive and masking cues are provided. Okay. Particularly, both the bold contrast of the right middle frontal cortex and the, that of the hippocampus, parahippocampus, were enhanced in each of the two patients, two group, patient groups. One in the spatial test, the other is in the lip, uh, lip reading prime test. So suggesting these two brain regions should be paid more attention. So this suggests uh, two lines of study in the future. Okay, according to home studies, so abnormal activity in the right middle frontal cortex in schizophrenia is related to deficit in context processing. So we want to find out the summer brain network that deal with the thing analyzed, not just a single feature. Okay, single test, the thing analyzed is one direction. Also, according to a recent study by Jensen, the G gene G72, which is very close to schizophrenia, this gene status influence verbal working memory performance in clinical normal participant with a high risk allele carriers scoring better than other groups. Particularly, this behavioral difference were accompanied by difference in fMR measured brain activity in the right parahippocampal gyrus with the high risk allele carrier showing the significant more deactivity than other groups. So I like the lawyer idea to combine the research at different levels gene levels, fMR levels, bring in imaging levels, and behavior levels. So this symposium probably can provide such opportunity for future studies. Yeah. Okay, here's conclusion. Patients with chronic schizophrenia, also with acoustic verbal hallucination, were more vulnerable to speech masking than their healthy controls. Second, patient participant retains the ability to use the perceived speech separation, but not temporal pre present lip reading to improve recognition of target speech against the information masking. In health controls, the unmasking cues increase the bold contrast in some brain, brain structures related to speech production selection, selective attention, and the irrelevant signal inhibition. In patient participant, however, the increased bold contrast in exhibit a different pattern from that healthy controls. These distinct, distinct patterns for the bold contrast in patients may provide a new biomarker for this disorder for both the diagnosis and the investment. 
So the idea is we solve the two big problems, and meantime, we may have a better understanding of the schizophrenia. So some young people seem like my idea, come to my laboratory, you know, collaborate with us, become my students. You know, some people, some students graduate, left, some new one come. Dr. Chao Wu was to uh, one of my PhD students, okay? She's uh, sitting here, and uh, I'm missing them terribly. Thank you very much. <laughs>